We're completing God's law. God's law was not complete. He calls people to complete it. Hello, my name's Rod Hembry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. This is Quick Study, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year, from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation 22, and we end up in a specific teaching mode. Today, we're going to be teaching on this. It is God's response to problems with fairness in God's law. Now, this is an interesting subject as we talk about the fairness of what God does and what he doesn't do and all of that. It's going to be a good one. Corey is here to help us understand what we're doing with history, Bible history. Yes, today we are going to be taking a look at the man Joshua who took over for Moses and led the conquest of Israel into the promised land as well as the great antiquity of the city of Jerusalem. All right, and very good. Ryan is here with Cosmic Mysteries. What's up, Ryan? Well, today we're exploring some of the amazing features of the sun and moon, as well as our special view of them from the earth. All right, all of this and more coming up as we continue. Get your Bible guide out, get your Bible out, and study with us as we go through the Bible. Where we are in time when we're studying through the book of Numbers is this time period of 40 years in the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt and before the conquest into the promised land. But there was a lot going on in Canaan. Take a look. Recently, a tiny piece of an ancient tablet was discovered in an excavation in Jerusalem. It preserves Akkadian writing that has been dated to around 1400 BC, making it by far the earliest writing to have been found in Jerusalem. Due to the small size of the broken clay document, it's impossible to piece together what it said. However, it is clear that it was of top scribal quality, and it has been noted how intriguingly similar it is to the famed Amarna letters. The Amarna letters refer to clay tablets that were a part of Pharaoh Akhenaten's records, dated to around 1400 BC. They were written by kings of surrounding cities and nations. A prominent figure in the Amarna letters is Abdi Haba king of pagan Jerusalem, who is credited with writing six or seven of the discovered letters, and is mentioned by name in at least one other. The letters from this king of Jerusalem have been specially noted by researchers to be of a particularly high scribal quality, and they also portray a picture of a thriving, industrious, well-established Jerusalem smack dab in the middle of the time period of the Judges. Biblically, this works. We're told that the people couldn't oust the Jebusites from Jerusalem. And King David gained special renown in the Bible for his conquering of this city, which he then chooses as his capital. The problem has arisen, however, that there has been almost nothing found archaeologically of this Amarna period city. Without the Amarna letters from Egypt, the Bible would stand alone in its description of Jerusalem before David. That is, until now. If this small clay fragment is what it seems to be, then it too proclaims, albeit quietly, that Jerusalem was indeed once a capable administrative center with a happening scribe. Considering the antiquity of so many of these cities is fascinating because for most of us, we're not really familiar with the, the history behind these cities other than what is recorded in the Bible. But one of the ways that uh, we can verify that the biblical stories are true is by learning from archaeologists and learning from, his, uh, from historians the history of these places and how that lines up with the Bible. Uh, and also the Bible itself adds so much to the archaeology and the historian's um, understanding of uh, the, the city itself and the culture surrounding the city. And it's amazing how these two things interact. Now, a little bit later in the program, we're going to be focusing on Joshua the man because he is the one that led the conquest of the Israelites into the land of Canaan. Now, this is not a nice period of history for the Israelites, but it was deemed necessary almost as a judgment to the land of Canaan. And you can look back in Genesis for that. The 
important lesson today is that God speaks the truth and no law of man overrules the principles of the plans of God. The laws of the daughters receiving a reward for their father because they really don't have any brothers, this is a reality that God spoke into a powerfully positive way. This is the way in which God law works. Wise guys know and with exploration we can discover what happens when unfairness is presented before our God. The daughters of Zavolahad had come to Moses with a problem and made a point. And the question is largely chauvinistic in society. The question was, what do we do, Moses? Numbers 27, verses 1 through 11. Then came the daughters of Zelephahad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh, from the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these were the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milcah, and Terzah. And they stood before Moses, before Eleazar the priest, and before the leaders and all the congregation, by the doorway of the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, but he was not in the company of those who gathered together against the Lord in company with Korah, but he died in his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be removed from among his family because he had no son? Give us a possession among our father's brothers. So Moses brought their case before the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelephahad speak what is right. You shall surely give them a possession of inheritance among their father's brothers, and cause the inheritance of their father to pass to them. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the relative closest to him in his family, and he shall possess it. And it shall be to the children of Israel a statute of judgment, just as the Lord commanded Moses. Numbers chapter 27, verses 1 through 11. This is quick study television. You know, it's an amazing thing when you consider, when people consider God's law. God's law from the Bible and back in the ancient times, they think, well, it's gone now. It's no good. It's over. We don't deal with that anymore. We have to make our own law. And there is this relegation of God's law to nothingness. But the truth is that God's law is just as good today as it was back then. In fact, the Bible is more relevant today than it was back then. You say, Rod, how does that work? I don't understand that. Well, stay with me for the next few minutes. We will discover what that means. We're going to look at today something that appears to be very chauvinistic and uh, a very much injustice to women. We're talking about something that people would say, see, that's what I mean. God's law is not fair to women. But listen to what happened. God's law wasn't complete. It was not complete. And the people who brought it to completion were some fascinating women who were from the sons or the daughters of Zolophat. Now, this is an interesting point, and here is our review. Our review is wisdom in daughters. Very important that you understand that. Our reading is Numbers chapter 26 to 27, and we're going to skip right to 27 because our focus is on Numbers chapter 27, verses 1 to 11. Now, as we look at this scripture, we have three points here out of the four. There's four in the Bible guide. Get your Bible guide out and join us and follow us. If you don't have your Bible guide, then make sure you take the address and write for it. Here is Numbers chapter 27, verses 1 through 5. Now, listen carefully. Janice already read it. We're going to read it again slowly. Then came the daughters of Zavolahad, 
the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh. From the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. This was the son of Joseph. And these were the names of the daughters. Mahala, Noah, Hogla, Melkawa, and Tirzah. Now listen, they stood before Moses, before Eleazar, the priest, and before the leaders, and they all, in the, and basically all the congregation, and by the doorway of the tabernacle of the meeting, and they said this, Our father died in the wilderness, but he was not in the company of those who gathered together against the Lord, in the company with Korah, but he died in his own sin. And he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be removed from among his family? Because he had no sons. Give us possession among our father's brothers. And so Moses, he didn't demand no. He said, well, I'm going to bring this case before the Lord. This is fascinating. Now here's the point. God responds in fairness to problems. He listens and he makes it right we must bring our problems to the Lord. These women had a problem. It appeared that the law of God did not address their concerns. Their concerns were real. They could not get property because they were not sons. And they said that to Moses. They said, we are not men. We're not sons, Moses. And, but we're just as much a part of the, the, the family line as the sons would be. And so Moses takes this to the Lord. It is very interesting. Now, the law is not complete. Moses is still giving the law, and it's not complete. So what do you think God does? How do you think God treats this situation? Well, in Numbers chapter 27, verses 6 and 7, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zavolahad speak what is right. <laughs> You shall surely give them a passion or a possession for of inheritance among their father's brothers and cause the inheritance of their fathers to pass to them. That's amazing. And here's the point. God presents the truth when we listen to him and not our own thoughts. Now, we know from history and from archaeology and from many things that we read in this time period, about 1400 B.C., we know that the situation is a very chauvinistic world. And women do not get the kind of protection that they would like. They don't get it. They don't understand it. And so here we are sitting in this situation, and you think that they would just go to chauvinistic, you know, forget it. But God says no. I want you to make these women sons. And so he does that in the Old Testament. That's absolutely stunning. It is an amazing thing. This is a law that God modifies and completes. Now, this is amazing because here's Numbers chapter 27, 8 and 9. He says, And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, if a man dies and has no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter. And if he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. Now that's amazing. And you think about that. And here is the point, of course, we look at it. And the point is this, as we uh, focus on the screen, God allows his law to be completed to preserve fairness for the people. His law wasn't complete. See, God had made his law, but his law was not finished. And he wanted it to be finished. So God knew that this man would only have daughters. God understand that daughters didn't surprise God. He, didn't, he wasn't surprised, you know, this man only has daughters. He wasn't surprised by that. God knew the future because God has foreknowledge. And the daughters come to Moses and they say, this isn't fair. And God says, they're right, Moses. Now that is amazing. And this is what God's law does for us. We need to understand that he completed it. And he, we, we need to understand that God desires fairness for every person. So don't just simply dismiss the law of God, oh, it's not fair. No, think about it and watch it develop. Now, it's a, very important for you to understand that many in the church, and especially in the Middle Ages, have messed up the law of God major. And they've made it a 
something that it's not by their interpretation of it. But we need to understand that God preserves the fairness of individuals. That is so important, and he did it back then, and he wants to do it today as we open our heart and consider it. Now, even though Moses is remembered as a man of God, and indeed he was a good man of God and a great leader, he was not exempt from his own humanity. He sinned and was not allowed to lead Israel into the promised land. That job was for Joshua. There are many titles that could be given to the man that succeeded Moses, but the title his family gave him was Hosea, meaning salvation and Moses called him Joshua, meaning Yahweh delivers. It's the New Testament equivalent to Jesus. The biblical biography of Joshua places him amongst the most respected Bible heroes and points the way to the types of roles the Messiah would later fill. Joshua served many years as aid to Moses. Surprisingly, he was the only man allowed up on Mount Sinai in the presence of the Lord with Moses. And in Exodus 33, we're told that he actually stays in the presence of God in the tent of meeting, even when Moses isn't there. Joshua also became a very accomplished military leader. His first recorded battle was against the Amalekites in Exodus 17. This is the first time we meet Joshua in the Bible. His loyalty to the Lord is displayed in chapter 13 of Numbers. After spying out the promised land, the other ten spies are despondent. Only Joshua and Caleb truly believe God can deliver his promises. This faith guarantees them entrance into the promised land and a long 40-year wait in the wilderness for the faithless to live out their natural lives. Later, Joshua is appointed by God to succeed Moses. Curiously, Moses' natural life is cut short. This faithful leader is taken away by God so that Joshua can take his place. Joshua's acts as a leader display his faithfulness. He leads the people across the Jordan River, circumcises the men, making them acceptable to God, and celebrates the Passover, their last act before claiming the Promised Land. Joshua himself had no successor. He and Moses had pointed the way to the Father, and now it was the people's turn to choose. The Bible is So Cool is the title of a 46-page booklet by Robin High School about the amazing facts of God's Word. Is there external proof of some of the remarkable stories in the Bible? Is there evidence of those stories? And does the Bible report on stories that are historically sound? The Bible is So Cool tells you. This booklet is ready for you now. For a gift of $5 or more above your regular giving, write and ask for The Bible is So Cool by Robin High School. In the United States, write to us at Post Office Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. And in Canada, write to us at Post Office Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W 5G2. Or you can order on our website at www.biblediscoverytv.com. That's biblediscoverytv.com. Ask for your copy of The Bible is So Cool. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television as we go from cover to cover through the Bible today in one year. We're not going to do it all today, but we do it over the year. It's interesting. Now, next time on Quick Study Television, we're going to be studying something interesting. It says this, we are bound by our words. What we must do, we must say. And actually, what we must say, 
we do. That's going to be a very interesting time of teaching on the next Quick Study television program. I hope to see you there. Right now, Ryan is here with Cosmic Mysteries. Ryan? The Bible tells us in Genesis 1 what the purposes of the sun, moon, and stars are. Additionally, it promotes the Earth as being unique among all the other planets in the universe. It's true. Out of the six days of creation, five were spent on preparing the Earth for life. But is this what astronomers are finding? Or are they finding that the Earth is really not that special, just a planet among many others? Let's study. The Moon is the closest celestial body to the Earth and is Earth's only natural satellite. It is approximately 3,400 kilometers in diameter and orbits in a relatively circular path at an average distance of 380,000 kilometers from the Earth. It takes about one month to make one full orbit and this in fact is where we get our month from. The Sun is about 400 times farther away from the Earth than the Moon is and interestingly is also 400 times larger than the Moon. This means that from the Earth, they appear to be about the same size. As far as astronomers know, the Earth is the only planet with this view. And it is because of this special view that we are able to view solar and lunar eclipses. Indeed, when the Moon comes in between the Earth and Sun, the Moon covers the Sun so precisely that we are able to view a stunning image of the corona. This view allows astronomers to unlock the chemical composition of the Sun using spectral analysis. To the naturalistic mind, there is no reason why the Sun and Moon are just the right sizes and distances to allow for eclipses. Additionally troubling for the naturalist is the fact that the distance of the Sun to the Earth is absolutely perfect for life, giving us on Earth just the amount of heat and light we need to survive. If the Earth were any more distant from the Sun, then the planet would be too cold for life. Conversely, if Earth were any closer, it would be too hot. Astronomers call this area the Earth is in the Goldilocks Zone because it is just right for life. There are many more of these just right conditions, so many in fact that it has become a fundamental truth in science called the Anthropic Principle. Many scientists have concluded that this finely tuned universe must be crafted by the hands of a creator. Indeed, the Bible tells us in its very first verse that it was God who created the entire universe. Later in that passage, the history of the moon and sun, called the lesser and greater lights, is also recorded. Genesis chapter 1 verses 14 to 19 record, Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. Using the Bible as our starting point, these scientific discoveries are no surprise. The almighty hand of God is clearly seen as we peer into space. The truth is that no matter where scientists look in the universe, they are seeing design. They're seeing a very finely tuned universe. And whether they deny it or not, they have noticed that the Earth is an extremely special and privileged place, and that the sun, moon, and stars are doing exactly what they were created for, according to the Bible. In fact, they've had to come up with so many alternative theories to try and explain away God. However, the hard truth is that the Bible is lining up with science. May we think on these things. You know, Ryan, that's true. There's a book that's published out there called The Perfect Planet or The Privileged Planet, I should say. It is an amazing study, and I read that, and there's a whole bunch of things several years back. And there's a whole bunch of things in there about where the Earth is positioned in the universe, how that just miraculously we can see. There's all kinds of these different things, and it's very, very interesting. And so that's called the privileged planet. Mm -hmm. Don't write us for it. Look on the Internet. You'll find it. It's very interesting. You know, we have to tell people something to write for us for that uh, DVD we have, which is great. Uh, that, and, and also, we want them to write and make sure that they understand they can get a hold of that thing. The Bible is so cool. That is a mm -hmm. great little book. It is. And so if you want to write to us and also just write to us to get a hold of the Bible Guide, you can go to the Internet. It is BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That is the Internet. That's BibleDiscoveryTV. Don't forget the TV. Uh, com. That's the Internet website. And also, if you can write to us, it's P.O. Box 150 Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668015050. That is in the United States of America. It's very important for you to 
understand that. And also, if you're in another country, use the Canadian address. If you're in Canada, write to us here in the studio at P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. That's very important for you to get that postal code in there. Also, you can call us at 724-733-8336 or 519-940-8. Three three eight. Make sure you get a hold of us today. It is wise to listen to the problems an incomplete law creates for man. This is what happened in today's resolve of the ways of God. The intent was to make the works of God apply to places of man in their setting so God could pull out the difficulties and complete the laws. The five women in Numbers 27 help us to understand and to work out the clear ways of God. It is important that God's men not be extinguished in their ownership. The place of chance is not considered in the works of God. Our Lord called these women to emerge and complete the incomplete law. The Bible tells us that God is aware of all who are born of men and women. This last minute of the program, I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings, and He is the reason that I'm here today, spreading His Word, talking about His Word. He's changed my life completely and totally. It doesn't mean that I'm perfect. I'm far from it. I've got a lot of problems, but I come to Jesus, and He helps me. And you can do the same. If you're in trouble today, if you're challenged today, come to Jesus Christ and let Him help you. Say, Lord, I need you today in Jesus' name.